Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Monday, August 22nd, 2022. It's great to be back with Professor Adam Weirman. Adam, once again, great to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Adam, today we're going to pick up in continuing this story where you recognized early on in your tenure at Caltech that there was tremendous opportunity to take collaborations even beyond CS. I framed my previous question broadly in terms of institute-wide in asking where you saw most fruitful areas of collaboration. And so you immediately went to economics with your answer. So before we get to the human dimension about the people that you were meeting and the ideas that you were considering and what you found relevant, if we could zoom out a bit, what was it generally about economics that might have pulled you in that direction, even decoupled from the individuals that you were interested in working with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think for, for me particularly, economics came into focus because, you know, in my uh, grad school, I was working on distributed systems, networking, these sorts of interacting systems. And this is an area where when you're taught it as an undergrad, you learn about protocols like TCP and UDP and IP and, you know, all the alphabet soup of these networking protocols. And they are, you know, these algorithms that in a distributed way figure out shortest paths, how to route packets, how to, you know, set things up in terms of the communication structure. But then, you know, when you learn a little bit more, you realize that they don't actually work in reality the way that you learn them in classes. And the reason is always kind of strategic interactions between the entities involved. So, you know, when you think of an ISP uh, routing traffic, well, you know, in some sense, it should be finding the shortest path. It should be, you know, routing things directly according to these protocols. But in reality, it ends up often doing things that are, you know, shorthand referred to as hot potato routing, where you don't take the shortest path, you take the shortest path to get it out of your network, because then you don't have to maintain it anymore. And it's, you know, it's a load on somebody else's network instead of yours. And if you can get everything out of your network very quickly, then you don't have to build up the infrastructure in your network, you don't have to have that expense. So it's cheaper for you. And so these incentives of the, you know, agents, the companies, the ISPs involved in, in networking, really meant that everything you learned in an undergrad networking course was really not the way uh, the network was working in practice. And people didn't have a good idea. You know, they were often surprised by this, right? So in, in reality, this would mean that you invested in the wrong parts of your network to improve them because you tried to remove the bottleneck, but the bottleneck wasn't actually the bottleneck because of the strategic behavior or it meant that you expected performance to be much better and you ended up with some failure in some part of the network that shouldn't even have been used, but was part of this hot potato exchange. Uh, and so it just was a huge indication that kind of all the theory, all the algorithms were uh, designed with the wrong assumptions in mind in networking. And you know, you, to, to figure out the right ones, you needed to study economics. Adam, in, in, in embedded in the question, you know, the idea that the, the questions were not framed in the right way, was there a deeper history of collaboration between CS and, and economists that you were aware of? Or was this really more of a, you know, an innate realization on your part that economists needed to be brought in on these issues in a way that they weren't previously? So there had been a growth. So even even at Caltech, which was one of the leaders in in this area, uh, starting in about you know 2003 to 2005, uh, there had been you know a lot of growth and in investment at Caltech, and and even before then, uh, there had been a lot of realization that economics and CS, broadly speaking, could learn from each other. And and one of the you know I guess the the canonical example of that is advert, computational advertising, so ad auctions. And so around the turn of you know the century was when uh, ad auctions were becoming into fruition. You know, when you went to a search engine, you went from this situation where instead of companies paying for a month to have their ad shown to everybody for every search, it was you know keyword targeted search search ads were showing up, and these search ads were starting to be allocated with auctions. And some of the folks at Caltech were uh, involved in the startups that made this a reality. Um, but you know this was a very particular form of interaction between economics and computer science around 
auctions and making money with very fast auctions in a computational world. Uh, and that wasn't necessarily my, you know, the place where I wanted to be. Um, but, you know, so that was one place where economics and CS had sort of hit. Uh, and then another one was around network science. And so this one was closer in spirit to me. So this, this was sort of understanding the structure of social networks. So this is when, you know, internet and web were growing and people have these large complex networks, massive, much more massive than they could study before, uh, that sort of somehow conveyed interaction of ideas or interaction of uh, at least virtual interactions between people. And, you know, so there was a huge excitement of now we can very easily measure and understand what these networks look like in terms of the structure and the connections. Uh, and so that was, you know, a really hot area around the turn of the century too. And and I, one of the leaders in that area, John Kleinberg, did a postdoc or did a sabbatical at CMU while I was there, and I got to talking with him. Uh, and so the and that was an area where it was, I'd say, led by CS, but still involved the social network uh, side of economics a bit. So there had been a bunch of these, but in in my world and in, in networking distributed systems, it was really just coming out and i wasn't the only one to recognize it but there was definitely a feeling that we needed to rethink our you know, networking protocols with an idea that strategic interactions were important to how operation would actually happen adam what were the big points of collaboration in terms of both efficiency and human behavior in other words what were the kinds of perspectives that economics or economists would bring in both of those areas at, as they related to the kinds of questions that you were framing and seeing where there needed to be additional expertise? Yeah, so so in, in mechanism sign auctions, there's this idea of you know uh, incentive compatibility, which means that you have to design your marketplace in a way that the users are incentivized to tell you what they their actual uh, beliefs, their actual uh, values for, for the goods that are being exchanged. And, you know, if you don't have incentive compatibility, it's much harder to design an efficient system because you don't really know what people are valuing in terms of the goods they're buying or in the networking sense in terms of the paths in the network that they're actually trying to send traffic on. Uh, and so, you know, the, and some, and the economic lingo, the, the, you know, the problem with the networking protocols is that they weren't incentive compatible. And so people, uh, kind of lied about whether, where they were trying to send traffic in order to get the traffic out of their network as soon as possible. And then it would correct after the fact to its true destination. Um, and so, so this idea of how to design allocation rules, auction designs, prices that were incentive compatible was really what the networking community needed and it hadn't been thinking about that at all. Uh, and so this, this idea that you have to respect incentives, you can't, you know, if you're, if you're not, if you're designing a system that's not consistent with people's incentives, they're just going to manipulate it. Uh, and that's what was happening with the routing protocols. A binary we've discussed previously in terms of research motivations, there's always the fundamental science and then there's the ideas about possible applications. Yeah. Where, where were you on that, on that spectrum when you first realized the value of starting to collaborate with economists at Caltech? So I, I was really, you know, this, this was my shift towards sustainability mm -hmm. and a big issue, you know, in networking, this was kind of a warm up because it wasn't sustainability focused, but it was still the idea of how do you get the incentives correct for, for the entities in the network that are making these decisions about where to send their jobs, how to schedule their jobs, how to route them through the network. Um, but the incentive incompatibility gets even larger when you think about you know, carbon uh, as the, you know, mode, you know, the, the, the metric you care about. Uh, and so, you know, one, once you're thinking about carbon as, you know, a part of the objective, uh, you know, the incentives become way harder to align and you, you know, you just have to take them on head first in terms of designing pricing structures and uh, contract structures for the, uh, you know, in addition to designing the engineer and, you know, the resource allocation, the scheduling. Uh, and so kind of that was, that was the big picture is that, the, you know, the markets need to be redesigned as well as the systems if you're going to be successful uh, in this direction. And so what would be the envisioned products, the outcome of this research? Who would it be good for? 
what's the timeline in terms of seeing it out there in the world? So the, you know, there are many steps along the way. And, you know, looking back now, it's easy to say, oh, this was the big picture that we were aiming at the whole time. Uh, it was a little, a little, you know, little uh, steps along the way led to the big picture. But, but there was always the idea that, you know, a, a data center could, uh, first of all, run on massive amounts of renewable energy that were local uh, and, you know, be adaptive to the amount of renewable energy so that, you know, in, in the case of the partner we had at the time, HP, which does a lot of video rendering for Hollywood style movies, these things are not, uh, you know, they don't have to be finished at 12.01 p.m., you know, uh, one hour after you submit the job. These are you know, jobs that are going to take days and days and days to run, and you can be flexible in when you run them and when you burst them and when you put them to sleep during their lifetime. Uh, and so that gave, you know, gives you a lot of flexibility to adapt to, uh, you know, the carbon mix of your generation footprint at any given point as a data center. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to do that, but we also wanted to make sure that these, you know, knowing that you're never going to get fully renewable on site with, with the data center, we want to make sure that they can be uh, value added for the grid. And so uh, early on, we talked about this in terms of virtual storage. So, you know, they should be a virtual storage facility for the grid where, you know, if the grid is uh, running hot and needs to shed some load, the data center can help it to do that by deferring some of these uh, you know, batch loads that are that don't have time constraints, uh, you know, an hour and, and giving back some, you know, using less generation for the grid and making it easier. And so to play that role for the grid. And, and it's that piece where the market design really was crucial uh, in the vision. So you needed to be able to design a way of kind of pricing and interact, you know, pricing the flexibility that the data center can provide so that it's uh, encouraged to be a, a good servant of the grid operation instead of just being, you know, locally trying to maximize its performance for its jobs. Adam, I want to get to the clients and the systems that you're specifically thinking of out in the real world, but just so that we have our names uh, uh, clear on the collaborations, this is John Ledyard and Frederico, help me on the pronunciation, Echenique? Echenique. Yeah. Echenique, and, and yeah. Jason Martin, who was a postdoc at the time. That's right. So those were the first three on the on the economic side. Yeah. And let me let me make sure, is it are they are the three of them working together and you sort of jumped in on that, or are you more one to one with each of them? More one to one with each of them. So we were all part of the center of at Caltech at the time, the sizzle, it was named at the time, Social Information Sciences Laboratory. And so we were all part of a group that would meet together every Friday for seminars. Um, Manny Chandy should also be in that group. He was also very active in, in sizzle at the time. Um, but then with each one, we had different, I had different collaborations or different sort of research problems. Uh, and so, so Jason and I were mainly working on the, uh, something a little different than what I've described, but still in the same line, which is the, how do you quantify how much inefficiency comes when the incentives are misaligned? So how how, how bad can things get if there's incentive misalignment? And, uh, you know, yeah. And so so that, that was kind of like, you know, how much do you, can you control if you do it right versus you do it wrong? I'm glad that you mentioned that Manny was part of this because you emphasized previously you know, for Mandy and Steve and, and Manny and Stephen Lowe, both of them were really crucial to sort of helping you yeah. get your bearings at Caltech. Yeah. Is that to say that Manny had already established inroads with economists by the time you joined the faculty and were thinking about these things? Yeah, definitely. So Manny already had connections with John, especially. Uh, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think they had worked together even in the you know, early 2000s around the uh, you know, Enron style crisis, right? Uh, um, as well, and so, so they had a you know history of just knowing each other at Caltech, and you know, I, I don't know how much they've done research together, but they were certainly very well of each other, very so, well aware of each other. So, because all of these individuals are so significant, let's just go one by one. What was John Ledyard working on that you know convinced you that there was fruitful opportunity there for you? Yeah. So John, John is mechanism design, so auction design, and so, so John was really. Uh, fun to interact with around that space because, you know, I, I you know I learned a lot about 
uh, important concepts in, in auction design. He was he was an I, I, I always characterize him as a near Nobel winner, and that uh, the the Nobel Prize in mechanism design went to a lot of things that he contributed to. Uh, he just wasn't named. Um, and you know, for him, we taught together, and we were sort of educating each other. So he wanted to learn about the CS. Uh, and I wanted to learn about the economics, and so we co-taught a class uh, where he lectured on kind of uh, traditional econ game theory, and I lectured on the stuff that computer scientists were calling algorithmic game theory. Uh, and you know, the it, it was this inter interesting interaction where uh, you know he would give a lecture, we would learn a lot. I would then give the CS view, and the economics economics faculty in the audience would all be saying, well, this is what economists did in the 60s. No, we did this one in the 80s. No, we did this. <laughs> or this is the wrong question because. And so it was it was one of these things where, you know, it's good that it wasn't my work because, you know, I was presenting a lot of things that the field had been done and the economists were really enjoying picking it apart, uh, but also pointing out nice things and, and different things about the way uh, that computer scientists were approaching it too. Because whenever there's you know these two interact fields interacting, there's always uh, an education process before you can contribute in ways that both recognize as, as valuable. Um, and so there was a lot of you know learning of language and uh, learning of what questions were interesting to each community in that class. I'll just point out I love how you you know emphasize that you know John wanted to learn CS and you wanted to learn economics, and so the natural result was. Let's teach a class on it because there's no better way of learning than teaching it. Yeah, exactly. So it, was, it was really valuable. And, and by the end of it, we had a group of grad students and postdocs and faculty that knew a lot about both areas. Um, and John in particular, and I, most of our collaboration was around energy markets. So I had a few students and that were really interested in that area. And John worked with them very strongly, worked with us very strongly. and really helped us kind of understand uh, why, you know, what what sort of classical economics results he would think of applying and how they would be adapted. And, and for our end, it was a lot about why those things couldn't apply directly to smart grid because of the physical constraints of the system, the physical constraints of the regulations and the markets. Um, and so then, you know, the com that led us both to, you know, doing the interesting research was how do you get around those constraints while still keeping as much as possible of the ideas from the econ literature. Where have you seen those ideas, those collaborations with John get adopted out there in the in the world? So we've had market design is interesting. You can't kind of just implement it and expect it to work. Uh, so a lot of it comes through in uh, ideas behind legislative uh policy and so we we actually worked closely with the california board of governors uh a few times and you know had some input into some of the regulations that came out around uh, deploying of uh electricity store or you know energy storage and things like that we also worked closely with southern california edison and some of the ideas ended up into some of their test market designs for demand response for commercial entities uh, and were evaluated in that front. Uh, and then with HP, we did some, uh, you know, market designs around data center demand response specifically uh, that were tested out for in some of the utilities in Colorado. Uh, and so, so those things then take on their life for their own. But you know, the the market designs, it's not like an algorithm that a company just takes and implements. It's you know, how does this idea then you know percolate uh, through the regulations that come out and shape what the market designs look like in the future? Um, and then the other place that we really uh, tried to have a big impact, and I think did, was around the recognition of exploitation of market power in, in electricity markets, especially around emerging aggregators. So you know, in the modern world, you have these. Uh, you know, home solar aggregators that might have 100,000 solar arrays and many with storage on people's homes. Uh, and each individual location is tiny and can't impact market prices. But if the whole of them works together, they can actually coordinatedly impact market prices by creating congestion on particular lines and then driving up that geographically you know, prices are geographically located. And so driving up prices in particular regions that they can then exploit. Uh, and this is very different style of market power exploit than 
uh, electricity markets used to usually look at, which is just to look at you know which generators are very large and then let's monitor them very closely. You can't monitor you know an aggregator of 100,000 rooftop solar arrays closely, uh, and then you know small changes in particular regions we showed can drive up prices dramatically, uh, and you know then lead to you know a nice profit for the company that does that. And so we were we were kind of giving that sort of example to anyone who would listen, which uh, then played a role in how uh, the market market structures for aggregators uh, ended up in terms of the legislation. Just chronologically, what were the most intensive years when you were collaborating with John? I don't know. Uh, was it like just like a year a short burst? Yeah, so it was probably in the like 2009 to 2011, 2012 period. Uh -huh. okay. So a little ways after I got there because it took a while to kind of uh, get to know the language and to build up those connections, and then we really hit the ground running. And the uh, and you know as the smart grid work really started to kick off right. uh, with Annie and Stephen and John, the four of us were kind of the lead, uh, you know, core group there. Uh, Let's move on to Federico now. What was his research okay. when you connected? Yeah, so Federico is a theorist theorist, uh, and I really loved working with him. You know, but the the work there was pure theory. Uh, and so, so Federico, in general, in his work, looks at matching markets, which are you know things like kidney exchange or ride sharing, where you have entities on two sides, and the goal of the marketplace is to you know put them together and match uh, you know the right uh, you know on one the right person on the right side with the right person on the other side. Um, and so, but you know, but a lot of his work is theoretically motivated and structural around that work. And for him, uh, you know, our, our initial, many of our collaborations were motivated from that class that John and I taught. Uh, and in particular, you know, afterwards we had a bunch of visitors come in and a very hot topic in the computer science side was around the computational complexity of markets. So, you know, how hard is it to find an equilibrium, for example? Uh, is this something that is a computationally easy task that we could do quickly with an algorithm or something that would be computationally hard, like, you know, MP complete or, or something like that in the, in, in the CS lingo, lingo. And there were a bunch of very celebrated results on the CS side that were arguing that computing equilibria was computationally hard. Uh, Which means and, what in this context? What makes it hard? So what makes it hard is, you know, even if you if you if I gave you a large market and you know a supercomputer, you wouldn't be able to compute the equilibrium prices of it. Uh, or there might there would be some example, some hard example uh, of such a market that you couldn't compute the prices. Uh, and you know the CS people were using this result as a bit of a hammer to criticize well established econ uh, equilibrium concepts. Uh, so for example, if you know I can't write a computer program to compute what an equilibrium price is for a market, how can you expect the market to arrive at an equilibrium price? Uh, is it, you know, I can't do something that a computer can't, right? And so uh, is that a critique of these markets? And these critiques never sat very well with economists, and it was very hard for computer scientists to understand why. Because you know, in their mind, look, we showed you there is a, you know, here's a complex market, but it's a market, and it's hard to compute, and I can scale it up. So there is this worst case example, uh, you know that. Uh, so, but but economists, you know, and so this led to a lot of conversations over the Friday beers at the app. Uh, with uh, Federico and John, whenever some computer scientists would come and give a talk about that, we'd always, you know, debrief and, they, you know, they'd say, oh, I don't like these style results. It's just worst case. It's, you know, it doesn't actually apply. Um, things like this. And so finally, Federico and I figured out how to kind of convey the economist response to, to this kind of result in a way that explained why economists weren't bothered by uh, that sort of a result and why that kind of wouldn't impact, you know, doesn't, wasn't actually a critique of these equilibrium concepts. And the, the idea was, it's, it's really, it's, it's a clever idea. I still like it a lot after all these years. Um, it's, it's to say, you know, the, the view of an economist is that these are models uh, of the real world, not the real world. And as models, we choose the model we use. 
Uh, and use for so what? Use for a given situations, right? So if you're using a model to try to analyze why prices in the grain market are reacting, they are, you're fitting that model to data and you're then using that model to make a prediction. Uh, and in that sense, worst case doesn't always mean much, right? And because you're choosing this model. And so the result we were able to prove is that basically given any data set, there is a model of that data set that fits it you know, perfectly, uh, that is computationally easy to find a Nash equilibrium in. So even if there are hard and there are hard uh, you know, market models, you can never force yourself to use one with data. If you're observing data about a real system, there's always an easy model of that system or a model of that system that's easy to compute an equilibrium in. And so you don't need to use these hard models uh, to predict uh, what the, you know, you know, what the situation is going on. And so in some sense, the fact that there is a worst case example is irrelevant to using these models in practice as predictive tools. Uh, and so this was a, you know, a counterpoint uh, to the way uh, computer scientists talked about, uh, you know, these computational complexity results that, uh, you know, some, it really had an impact a lot. You know, we, we got uh, some attention among the CS, uh, you know, bigwigs who were uh, looking at computational complexity to say like, oh, this is a really interesting perspective. And now there's a line of work kind of in that direction that followed up on that, uh, that style of analysis. Because obviously there are clear applications in matching markets to the theory, as yeah. you called him, you, you know, Federico is a theorist, theorist. What were some of the pleasures in just not being focused on applications, right. just drilling down into the theory? Of, but what was useful for you in that regard? It was really, it was really great because, you know, you know, I think a lot of my development is, uh, you know, what I know about economists came from John and Federico and and for John, it was co-teaching, and for Federico, it was because any time in a meeting where I didn't understand some analysis or the reason why some economists use some definition, he could just stop for a second and give me a 10-minute lecture on it on the whiteboard, and, you know, I understood it after that. And, and so, you know, the collaboration there was extremely fruitful, both in terms of the papers we wrote, but in terms of, you know, just learning from each other around these areas. Uh, and, you know, I think we walked away from it, like both feeling much more confident in the other person's field <laughs> than when we started out, which is ideal, not only as an output of, uh, you know, education, but also in papers. Um, uh, and then we did do some, some more applied work together. So uh, we, one of the projects in recent years that was on our outreach oriented was applying uh, ideas from matching market theory to the problem of uh, school lotteries, which is a, you know, a major application area for people who were, are applied working in that space. Uh, but my kids go to Pasadena Public Schools, and as soon as I went in and participated in the lottery for, uh, you know, kindergarten for my oldest one, I, you know, saw the way it worked, and it was, you know, not following best practices in terms of design, and, you know, was manipulable and inefficient in, in various ways. And so, Federico and I basically got together and uh, reached out to the district and gave them some ideas. And then over the next nine months, kind of worked with them to on their data, evaluate those ideas and, you know, make a proposal and, and took it to, you know, school board and uh, city council and got it approved. And so now our ideas are, are running the, uh, uh, you know, school choice uh, lotteries in, in Pasadena for you know, every student at all levels. Oh, wow. And do we see these? I mean, that's a local example. Where do we yeah. see some of the, you know, the, the output of this research more broadly in industry and in society? So uh, more broadly in industry and society. So I, I hadn't pushed that as much, but Federico, I'm just speaking for him, Federico and uh, Laura Duval, who was here, um, they, they also worked in kidney exchange. So matching markets in general have, have some impact there um, as well. But for, for me, the, the big push on, on anything matching related was just in, in the school choice. And so the, you know, the idea, the ideas there are now uh, hopefully extending to other districts. There's the local 
provider that uh, Pasadena used that had to implement all our ideas. And now they're selling their product to as many other districts as, as they can. So uh, there are, I don't know the names, but there's a bunch of other districts now that are using the same sort of algorithm and structure that, that Pasadena adopted because now it's the default for this, this company. And then finally, Jason Martin, where does he slot in in all of this? Yeah, so Jason um, was a postdoc. So he was here for the first two years I was here. Um, and he's now faculty at UC Santa Barbara. Um, still working on game theoretic interactions with control. So, so he, you know, he and I really, you know, I, since I was fresh out of grad school and he also was fresh out of grad school, we were both kind of starting at the same time. So even though I was faculty and postdoc, we were just peers uh, working on problems together. And, you know, there, like I said, it was, it was more related to the initial motivation, motivation of networks and incentive issues and networks leading to inefficiency. Uh, and so we were looking at problems like that. So how, how much inefficiency do you give up, you know, enormous amounts because of incentive structures, do you give up little, Is, are there ways through uh, tolls and through, you know, additional structures like that, that you can put pricing on particular links that will uh, limit the inefficiency that comes from this kind of misaligned incentives of the agents and networks. Adam, just a generational question, with John Ledyard being a more senior faculty member and Jason being a postdoc, what view did that give you in terms of, you know, <laughs> just like some of the more traditional ways of approaching problems versus somebody fresh out of a dissertation thinking about these things? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge difference. I mean, John John was in, you know, it was a very senior faculty at that point, and he was, it was great to see someone who had kind of been around for as long as he had, seen as much as he had, still be excited about kind of new areas emerging and wanting to jump into them. at that stage in a career it's very easy to just say yeah i know what i'm doing i'm an expert in this i'm going to keep doing it i'm going to push forward and john is just not that sort of researcher who was jumping head in head on into computer science uh and algorithms and you know uh these sorts of tools uh at, you know late stage of his career there's very few people that have that kind of Gutsiness. So it was a good signal that Caltech is yeah. full of people who are willing to, you know, <laughs> go out of their comfort zone at any stage of their career, um, which I think was exciting. And and Jason's the op it was the opposite, right? He was he was fresh. It was just like here are exciting problems. What do we need to learn? Let's go at it. Uh, and so that that's the same stage I was at, where you just kind of the world is your oyster. There's no nothing stopping you from jumping into some new path or some new direction. Have you maintained collaborations with Jason over the years? Yeah, we, we haven't written papers in a little while, but we, we keep in touch, you know, all the time. Um, he was just out here a couple of weeks ago and we were chatting about work. And, um, so, yeah, he's 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 my first, uh, you know, advisee that became a faculty member. So so he always will have kind of that special check in. Um, Adam, a general question with funding. We talked in, you know, our first discussion, just the broader narrative of nowadays it's computation, everything, right? CS is part of the equation with everything. Since this is early on in the game, both in terms of the field and your career, in the collaborations with the economists, did that provide a new window into funding agencies and opportunities, or just more generally, the kinds of people who would be supportive of this work that might not be so obvious if you were more siloed within CS? Yeah, I, so it was an interesting time, actually. So you know, even at that stage, funding for CS was, you know, funding was growing prior to enrollments growing, at, I think, at Caltech. So like NSF style funding was on its way up um, in CS and not in economics. Uh, and economists often don't have the grant chasing model because uh, their students are often funded through TA ships and things like that. Uh, and so they're, you know, in doing this stuff, it was interesting to see that it was a new approach for the economists to go after NSF grants. Uh, and so like when I was saying, you know, we're good, let's apply for a grant on this, they're like, oh, I don't do that, but sure, I'll see if I can help out kind of thing. And so even though there were senior people, uh, you know, Federico and, and John, much, se much senior than me, it was me leading the, the grant writing process. And, you know, but because of that, there wasn't a natural grant, grant funding side on the econ for this work. So all the funding came from more CS. And one of the, you know, lucky things or, or timely things was, you know, the NSF kicked out a new uh, program for kind of the first
first three years I was a faculty member that was spoke focused specifically on growing CS and economic interactions. Uh, and so we hit that, you know, each year and it was a very, uh, you know, it was a nice uh, bonus in terms of having funding opportunities open to me because of being in that area. And, and that definitely did magnify our ability to kind of move quickly in that direction uh, and incentivize us to go. The incentives were aligned and incentivized us to move in that direction. Um, and then I was very shocked when it went away and it became actually very hard to get funding in that direction because computer scientists for a large part didn't have much econ background and econ didn't have a great funding pool of their own and so you kind of when that you know kickoff program wound down it became much more tricky to find the right sweet spot between areas in cs where people would appreciate the uh would actually it's not appreciate the wrong word understand the you know the motivation for the econ problems and understand what interesting questions were in econ versus what kind of a cs question would be that maybe wouldn't be interesting to the econ side adam a very specific question based only on a hunch i have no idea if you have visibility on this you'll let me know after the 2008 crisis there was discussion at caltech about maybe having a business school because that would be great for you know, revenue, funding, we would do it yeah. the Caltech way, all of these things. My question is, in working with the economists, I can imagine discussions where, well, if Caltech does a business school, it's going to be a Caltech business school. <laughs> and by definition, that would mean very unique approaches that might include... Yeah a CS perspective, like you're yeah, not getting CS. elsewhere. Were you involved in those discussions? Are you aware of how that all played out? Only, I was too junior to be yeah. seriously involved. So almost like you described, there were a few conversations like that. Like uh, if we do X, it would be a, you know, uh, unusual one, a theoretical one, a, you know, cross-disciplinary involving CS and playing the sizzle strength, but never more than that. That was that was not something I was uh, wanting to be engaged with as a, you know, new junior faculty. Um, so I was happy to let the senior people uh, talk about that and just kind of hear what I heard. Uh, so the bigger question there, it's always the perennial debate at Caltech, like, do we stay small? Do we get bigger? How do we get bigger? Is the business school idea? Does it crop up? Is it it sort is it dead and buried? Where where is that nowadays? I I haven't heard anything serious about it in a long time. What I the the I think the part that is alive in terms of a pensional idea is growing finance and understanding what a Caltech finance program would look like, finance and entrepreneurship. Um, but I think you know my I think those are those are the more near term right. So if if the Lind Institute grows finance in a way where we have, you know, a strong finance wing and we have a little entrepreneurship wing, now you have legs that maybe you could build a business school around and you could have a discussion like that seriously. But right now, you couldn't. We wouldn't have a curricular uh, structure for that uh, that would be tied into research. So it would be, yeah, something different. I I, I can't see it being a uh, something that would come out in, in the near term. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Uh, as not so junior of a faculty member anymore, I mean, whether you have the bandwidth for it or not, is that a compelling idea? Is that something that you'd be interested in pursuing from from a CS perspective? So it, I think the, you know, the thing that the part of that world that is compelling to me intellectually as a for Caltech is operations research. Uh, and so operations research is a big part of business schools uh, and you know, that's the piece of the brand that I think would make sense at Caltech. You know, if you had enough of some of the other things to, to make it well-rounded, but then you built your strength around OR, that would be compelling at Caltech because then, you know, you're bringing in optimization, you're bringing in stochastic, you're bringing in data science and, you know, statistics, these sorts of tools. Uh, I think you could build something around that that would be strong and that would benefit the rest of Caltech and not just be its own island separated and you'd, you'd basically need to you know combine those foundational tools with some entrepreneurship and finance to have a program and you know I, I do think that could be something that uh, say you know HSS could uh, build some strength around uh, but you know it would have to be a commitment and and size is is always a challenge right because you need faculty to commit to you know having meaningful engagement there but on the research side OR fits in very well with the brand of CMS and the goal of connecting kind of the computational 
side of the department with the uh, applied math of the side of the department, that overlap is, is basically operations research, uh, data science operations research. Beyond the obvious benefits that, that this would confer within the Institute for that future alumni pitch, right? Mm -hmm. Here's yeah. why we should have a program. <laughs> what are the obvious needs out in the world for which a Caltech focus on OR would really be impactful? Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the OR piece, it, the argument is very much the same as why you need data science and uh, machine learning, right? So if, if you're if you're trying to build a modern data scientist, uh, they need their statistical tools, they need the machine learning tools, but they also need to kind of know how to make decisions using those tools. And that's often what we miss in the current Caltech programs is that kind of business oriented decision making on top of the uh, statistical foundations, right? We can teach you uh, all the statistical tools, all the machine learning tools. We can teach you why they work. You can know how to prove them correct and design your new ones. Uh, but the piece of then making that operational in a entrepreneurship or business or finance type environment, rather than in a technological development environment is not something that Caltech has, uh, has focused on educationally. Um, so in, I, in identifying this area that Caltech is not doing, in what what is the response there more we should be doing that or is the response more if that's what you're looking for then you should just go to stanford i i depends on who you talk to um i i think increasingly it's shifting towards the we need to do that yeah um, because if if you want these tools to have an impact on society yes there's one path which is straight through research but even through research, you know, so many Caltech faculty uh, and grad students go and take their work, their research ideas out into the world in a company or in, you know, uh, towards an impact on regulation or things like this. And to have some training around that decision making process, I think would be really beneficial for Caltech's impact, the impact of ideas coming out of Caltech. Uh, you know, beyond academia. All right, so just walk me through some Caltech administrative culture. If this is something <laughs> oh, no. that you would want to pursue, what well, I mean, how do you how do you do that? Is it do you talk to the division chair? Do you bring in outside funding? How would you get that off the ground if you wanted to? Um, this is curious. I, I, this is not the conversation I was expecting, but let me think. So, I mean, we've we've done this in you know CMS. I I I have a. You know, I like to create new programs, um, and so we have you know created PhD programs. We've created uh, you know undergrad majors and minors and things like this. The the difference from you know a master's oriented program at Caltech, uh, I'd say you know philosophically, is that you know if you're in a master's program, an MBA or an OR master's, uh, your next step is kind of 99% not a research step. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just different philosophically than the next step for nearly all of Caltech programs today. Right. So you know, nearly all of our programs today, the next step, there's a reasonably large percentage of the people that do it that go on to a research path. Uh, and so, you know, things are optimized for, for that approach. And so having a program that, uh, you know, by its definition has a next step that is not that is different. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I think that's the biggest struggle here is, you know, how many, you know, could administration, division chairs, provost, uh, et cetera, uh, kind of concretely say, yes, we, we want to train, you know, specifically towards that career path rather than training towards research path and saying, you know, if you go out and do, uh, you know, a, a company with your idea, that's great. And, you know, you're going to be smart enough to figure it out as opposed to kind of uh, training specifically for that path. Uh, but, you know, the structure would be you know, get faculty buy-in, get people to sign off it and then take it up the chain uh, and see, you know, be ready to argue for it and argue, you know, the pluses and minuses and argue, and, you know, uh, give the, the case for how we benefit Caltech. And, you know, I, this would be a you know a tougher one. Uh, like I said, that would be a long term. But you know, an OR master's program or an OR oriented 
academic program is not so different from the CMS PhD program we created. You could, you know, at a different school that might have been called an operations research uh, PhD program because it does involve, you know, optimization stochastics and such from the applied math side as well as the the data science machine learning uh, from the CS side. Have you per supervised students who've expressed an interest in like a terminal master's kind of, yes. let me learn OR and I want to go out into industry? What's your response to that kind of interest? We we are thinking about one, not a, not a business oriented one, but uh, thinking about a couple of terminal masters in CS. Uh, and faculty bandwidth has been one of the biggest uh, challenges to making them happen. Uh, not necessarily that they're not interested, they just haven't had the time to think about it deeply, you're saying. Yeah, and to get it through and to, and, and more more than, not, actually not quite that, it's more the like, do we have enough faculty to operate it on top of what we're already doing? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the, the one that I think has the most legs is a master's, you know, a terminal research uh, master's program for Caltech undergraduates. And I hope that we can, can make this happen where, you know, the, the Caltech undergraduates who want to spend an extra year doing research at Caltech can get a master's and then can take that uh, research either towards a you know startup or towards a PhD program at the end of that fifth year. Uh, so then, you know, that's a that's a big win for everybody involved. Caltech faculty get research, you know, researchers that they've begun to work with. They get extra time with them. Uh, the undergrads get that experience uh, when they're going to before they go to a PhD or before they go out to a you know startup to take their ideas with them. Um, and so everybody is all in favor of it. It's just a question of you know framing it in a way where with our current faculty size and our current uh, you know ratio to students already that we're not kind of creating even more load for our classes, for our faculty time in a way that, you know, uh, hurts other educational programs that we're running. And looking at peer institutions, had these trend lines already been developed elsewhere? Would Caltech be playing catch up to some degree? Yeah, I mean, it, the, the big schools have many masters and different undergrad programs because you know, they're big and they can they can do that. Uh, so I, yeah, I don't. I, we certainly wouldn't be leading the way with a you know four plus one masters program. There, there are many of them around. Um, but you know, our students often do more research in their four year undergrad program right. than uh, schools in their four plus one uh, masters program. So uh, they're you know I don't think we're behind educationally. It's right. just we don't have a program specifically called that. Um, yeah, so it, it would be interesting. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, the, you know, our branding or, you know, B-School branding is, is definitely something that is a, uh, you know, potentially beneficial, but uh, a hard, uh, hard path towards fruition, you know, at, at the Caltech uh, Institute level. Adam, I want to pick up on a very interesting thing you said in, in your early collaborations with Stephen Lowe when it was just starting to think about sustainability and the Resnick Institute mm -hmm. and things like that. You mentioned that the emphasis institutionally was on hardware before systems, meaning that right. the kinds of things that you were working on with Stephen were they were at the periphery of the core of sustainability research circa 2010, 2011. So let me just yeah. ask generally, why would that be the case? Why would it be hardware before systems? It seems to be a little counterintuitive. <laughs> it's the systems as the foundation and the hardware from it. So I wonder if you could just explain those distinctions, why it would happen that way. Yeah, I I actually struggled with this at the time a bit because, uh, you know, we were, uh, the way it came up was often uh, sort of in students applying for fellowships or uh, funding internally and the evaluation process tending to come back with comments that clearly placed less of an emphasis on kind of putting things together as a whole rather than the devices that make up the parts. Uh, and, and I think actually, you know, at the time I sort of, it's a very natural thing, right? It, it's, it's easy, I think, for people to understand, you know, if I can make a battery that's a hundred times more efficient, then, you know, I can store solar for days and, you know, it makes everything better. Or if I can build PV that is, you know, uh, 10 times, you know, uh, we all get 100% more efficient, then, you know, everything gets a lot better immediately. And so I think it's it's that kind of one sentence statement of the goal uh, that is often very easy and compelling. 
Uh, and then even if you're working on a very sort of esoteric theoretical piece of, you know, the chemical reaction that may one day lead to a battery, you can talk about, you know, that very uh, concrete, easy to understand piece of impact that your research is building towards. Uh, whereas in the system level, it's necessarily kind of complicated and convoluted to understand why what you're doing is going to have an impact or is needed or whatever. And, uh, and often the benefit or the impact or how you combine things depends on the devices. And so if someone believes that they're going to be able to make the max battery, maybe they think that this piece of the system's work is less important or whatever. And, and so it, it becomes just a little bit more entangled uh, to explain it, even though, you know, everybody, I think, thinks it's thought it was necessary at the time. It was just somehow never rose to the same level of priority as doing the whole thing. And, and I, part of that was on, you know, us being able to provide that simple line of, uh, you know, if you can do X, then, uh, you know, this will happen. And, you know, often that, that line is a negative one for the system. Like if you don't figure out how to, you know, integrate uh, solar efficiently, plugging it in will just lead to more blackouts. Uh, and so it's, it's often, you know, there's this negative piece that somehow doesn't have the same resonance, uh, positive resonance as building, uh, you know, the next generation battery. Um, and so the data center work, I think, often had a little bit more resonance than the grid system level work, because you could just say, look, we don't do something data centers alone. You know, these these hundreds of buildings are going to be ten percent of the electricity usage and emissions in the U.S. And you know, if we can change it, then uh, you know we can keep them at one percent, um, kind of thing. And so that became a very like easy positive message yeah. for you know people outside of CS to understand, even if they didn't understand how you could do it or why data centers use so much energy. So before we get to how you and Steven slotted into what was already happening institutionally with sustainability, just on the one-to-one -one basis, what was he working on that was so obviously, you know, interesting for you at that point? When I joined, you mean? Or, yeah. 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 So when I, when I joined, uh, Steven was just coming back from a startup. Right. So he was coming back from his fast soft uh, startup, which was, you know, TCP protocol based stuff. Uh, and, you know, he was looking for the next thing and uh, he was dabbling in energy. So he basically, you know, came back and I was expecting him to be, you know, a hardcore networking person when he got back. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do <laughs> energy. I just need to figure out what in energy I'm going to do. <laughs> and so it, it was, you know, an interesting kind of uh you know year year and a half to uh where you know yes he was still churning out some research and networking because he still had some students interested in that area and you know there's always that kind of backlog but everything that he was reading everything that we were talking about in group meetings was to try to figure out where you could have impact with you know our style of work uh in the sustainability space uh, and so, you know, I, I had started working on data center stuff and he, he dabbled a little bit in that with me. Um, and he also that sort of dabbled in uh, kind of the extension of his startup to uh, energy, right? So not just focusing on the endpoints like the data centers, but the actual routers and devices in the network. Could you have, you know, TCP like protocols that made them more energy efficient? Um, but, uh, you know, then at the end of the day, he really hit on smart grid and the optimization uh, of protocols and, you know, protocols, they don't call them that, but uh, in the smart grid as being, uh, you know, the, a really impactful place to go. Uh, and, you know, the, the time, I think he, me, many, most of the people in the field were a bit naive because there was this uh, story that, well, you know, uh, for the internet, we went through this transition where we kind of, packetized everything and had this architectural separation and this gave us all this power to innovate we'll be able to do the same thing in power uh and you know that optimism of we'll just be able to bring the ip architecture over to power uh lasted maybe two or three years uh until people realized no 
the complication of Kirchhoff's laws and complexity and non 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 convexity of the system and you know all of these things make it so that you can't have the same architectural separation that you had in the internet in the power system. Um, and so I, I think at that point there were a lot of networking people who retreated back to networking because they realized their same tools wouldn't apply. Uh, that Stephen and I and and you know many others stayed and you know persisted uh, and you know. I think he, he found, you know, some big hits in terms of how to do optimization, uh, you know, of the, you know, these protocols, but really these systems, these distributed control policies, uh, using some of the same tools, even though the architectural separation and the architectural design was very different. Just to clarify the timing, you were already thinking about data centers before the collaborations with Steven started? Um, before, I, I guess somewhere in there, yeah, I think, yeah, probably a little bit before. So it's hard to, it's hard to remember precisely, uh, but that was kind of, you know, my baby, uh, and Stephen kind of joined in and helped and thought about it. Uh, you know, and he, he, he was thinking about energy and networking and distributed systems, uh, but the data center piece specifically was kind of, uh, something that I drove from a very early time. Uh, in the in the group, and was that at all related your interest in data centers with what the economists were doing, or was that really your own thing? That was sort of my own thing. There was some piece right with the economists. It was still the like distributed agents uh, pushing, uh, you know, having their own control and and inefficiencies that come from that. And in the data center world, that's each server is operating in a distributed way, making its own scheduling decisions, making its own resource allocation decisions, whether to go to sleep, whether to save power, whether to run at full load. Uh, and so again, there, there was the same sort of questions around how to, you know, design the policies in a way that they were incentive compatible for the individual servers. Uh, and so there was collaboration on that front with them. And there was collaboration on, with Stephen on the policy scheduling networking side. Uh, but kind of, you know, I was the, so I'm sort of somehow at the center of, of all the data center discussions, uh, working with different people there. So because this was coming from you, do you have a clear memory of why data centers? Did you read something in the Times about energy consumption yeah. or what was it? <laughs> Yeah, no, it, data centers, it, it was the studies, I think I mentioned these in one of our, one of our chats earlier, these, these studies that, uh, I think it was NSF, but one, a government agency really put out with forecasts. So, you know, that I was part of, before those studies became public, I was aware enough of them coming out and of the people involved in them, uh, that really, it was very clear, uh, you know, what they were going to say and what the growth trends were going to look like. Uh, and, you know, given, given my interest in scheduling and resource allocation for my PhD and doing that in, you know, these distributed system and cloud environments, uh, this just felt like a perfect fit for me where, you know, my expertise on scheduling and resource allocation could be put towards a, you know, big societal problem, uh, that, you know, was, t you know, needed to be solved quickly uh, to prevent this growth from just compounding year over year. And I think as you explained previously, researchers, the NSF recognized the problems, mm -hmm. these energy trend lines, but the industry, the Microsofts, the Amazons, initially they were not proactive about this. They were not proactive at all uh, initially. It took quite a while for them to respond. They weren't even measuring to really understand how bad. And, and this is where actually there was a greed piece report that served as a good slap on the wrist for companies and woke them up a little bit, at least to do superficial things so that they didn't get an F on the, you know, Greenpeace energy efficiency scorecard that they put out yearly. Um, and, you know, so that came as one way to get industry involved, but, but it was, you know, thinking back the, you know, the initial conferences where all this stuff was presented, the, the typical feedback you would get would be, you know, huge interest from academics and then huge complaints from industry folks basically saying, you know, this isn't realistic, you're never going to be able to do this, or uh, the costs are going to be too high, or it's going to impact all these reliability, but, you know, you know, issue after issue was raised as to why this was not something that would be feasible or viable. It took, it took a few years for the industry response to be something like, 
maybe we could make this work or, you know, maybe it would work, but it would be more expensive to operate or, you know, it took a while to get to that point. Um, so obviously there's no regulatory framework. There's no pressure no. coming from government about like, you know, cars in California, we have to reduce emissions by X amount. There was none yeah. of that happening. None of that, no. Did you no. get involved at all because of, you know, the obvious efficacy of regulatory as a way to, you know, get industry to where you want them to go? Did you become involved at all in that from a technical perspective saying, I think we can get here and there need to be the mandates in order to make sure there's compliance? Um, not, not in a huge way in data centers specifically, but... Uh, definitely in the discussions, some you know, I was definitely in the room for a number of these discussions, uh, um, and you know, I, th I think same thing that's going you know going around in fairness and privacy right now in the algorithmic world. One of the roles I think of the sort of cutting edge researchers in this in that space were to just prove that this was feasible. Yeah, um, and so you know you had to demonstrate the technology that this could be done before there's any door open for regulation. Uh, and you know, the, the, it took you know, a good four years to get to that point where you could really sort of viably say, you know, this is feasible algorithmically, this is you know, not gonna destroy the systems involved. You can you know, demonstrate this in large scale uh, settings. And so it was a long haul just to get to that point. Uh, the sequencing at Caltech institutionally, where it was hardware before systems. Yeah. How did you and Stephen put that to your advantage in terms of building on what was already there and demonstrating that you had things to share that would be quite useful? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great, that's a good question. Uh, so maybe the, the best example of that was Stephen's EV charging test bed, which I had you know some hand in, but but he was he was the leader and really carried the ball and all of that. Um, and so there, you know, this, this lets you test battery management, it lets you plug into grid systems and do dynamic, dynamic adaptation of response, uh, while also demonstrating kind of the EV system sophistication itself on the system. And, you know, and so that, that, that sort of deployment really was a way of bringing in some of the hardware that already existed in the development that happened on campus. and integrating it into a system that was kind of adaptively serving the whole campus. Uh, it that's, I think, you know, a valuable research test bed uh, on its own right, but also I think a good sort of message to the campus of why this stuff was important and the role it could play. Uh, yeah. Just to fast forward to the present, where is that balance now in terms of hardware and systems? Is it about where you would want it to be? Uh, you know, I'd always like more systems. <laughs> I, I, I think that systems, people always underestimate how important they are. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, the negative message is, is not, uh, you know, uh, as upbeat as, as you might like, but, you know, if we don't, the best battery technology in the world is not going to help us if we don't have a system that can dynamically adapt uh, loads and demands to use that battery. Uh, and, you know, the... Yeah, we, we see it over and over again. There was a great example, you know, I mean, the Texas examples of the last few years have been really amazing in terms of, you know, market failures, system failures, despite huge investment in very sophisticated, you know, storage and wind and solar technologies throughout the grid. Um, and, you know, there's some shining examples where some of these power walls really serve well as, you know, distributed energy resources and protect neighborhoods of the grid. But in general, you know, the system, Failures have been widespread in ways that they don't need to be because of underinvestment in the system architecture and, and our understanding there. Uh, and so I think you know that stuff is going to continue and and become more and more dramatic unless we can get ahead on the system side. Uh, even even if uh, you know it's uh, I can't you know that it's one I, I remember being asked a question on one on a panel around you know what is the smart grid going to look like if everything is successful and you know the the realistic answer is not that different maybe you'll have some smart light switches going on and off but the human experience isn't that different it's the system experience that will just be more reliable more efficient more green you know all of these things and it's hard to you know 
unless you uh, are bought into the you know the importance of green energy and and the efficiency of getting to a 100% renewable grid it's it's not as exciting to to see that number creep up as it is to have a more tangible uh, salient outcome so we we need the like smart grid uh you know, product that, uh, you know, makes it really obvious to the consumer what they're getting from, from all these investments. To return to this overview discussion about the growth among undergraduates in CS yeah. and interest in computer science, you know, this amazing, you know, fact that you shared with me in our last discussion that it was really a tiny program for undergraduates when you joined. So, to understand its massive growth in the last 15 some odd years, from your specific vantage point of branching out into economics, looking at your perspective from CS and, and going into sustainability, how did both of those areas contribute to what I assume must have been obvious among undergraduates about just the possibilities as as CS as an undergraduate major? How, how would you root your particular interest with this overall trend line and growth of the of the major? So, I mean, I, I don't think any one, you know, the, the, the growth has been so robust that it's not that any one area, you know, can be tagged to particular sorts of growth, except, you know, in recent years, maybe machine learning uh, being, you know, a huge overwhelming uh, motivation for a lot of the undergraduates. But, but I think in general, it's, it's more that the breadth and wealth of applications that's appealing. So one of the biggest changes we made in the undergrad program early on was to get, you know, pizza courses. So to get really nice pizza courses where freshman year when the students join, they see 10 faculty talk about 10 different research areas often overlapping. We tell them the story of CS plus X and the, you know, impact that has. Uh, and so that means, you know, so they're taking that pizza course combined with CS1, which each project is focused on a different area, whether it be biology or chemistry or astronomy or, or graphics or you know, within CS. And so they've seen, you know, 20 different applications of CS to wildly different fields by the time they're done their first term at Caltech. Uh, and that's just in huge stark you know, contrast to the introductory experience in other majors. Uh, and so to kind of just see the breadth, I think is one of the most compelling things. So it's not that, you know, everybody wants to jump in and do sustainability as their application, but they know they can have impact on sustainability, they can have impact on astronomy, they can have an impact on all of these and whichever way they go, this tool set is gonna help them with that. I think that's the message that many undergrads find compelling is that whatever I do, whatever application area or research area or I want to focus on, I'm going to need this stuff and this stuff will help me and give me a competitive advantage. Uh, and so let me do it and then I'll add on a double major in some other area if I get excited about some other area specifically later on, but I'm I know I want to do CS. Administratively, how did CS deal with these numbers? I mean, was it sort of gradual? Is it ever, was there an avalanche one year of it's interest? It's been gradual. It's been, I mean, gradual. It's been, you know, 10, 20% a year, every year. Yeah. Um, except for a few years. You know, there's been a few times where we say, oh, it flattened this year. Maybe we've hit our peak. And then, you know, <laughs> the next year. Uh, and so it, it's been, you know, slow, uh, you know, medium and steady, not slow and steady. Um, and the... It, a lot of the growth happened while I was department chair and so, or option rep before department chair. And so we, we did spend a lot of time thinking about how to respond within the constraints that Caltech uh, has for you. Uh, and it, it became a multifaceted thing. So it, it became, you know, whereas the, the sort of answer many other schools had was higher in proportion to undergrad growth and, you know, just keep X percent of your faculty in CS. It's not the answer at Caltech because if you wanted to hire in proportion to undergrad growth, you have 50% of your faculty at CS, and that doesn't make for an intellectually diverse research institution. Um, and you can't get there uh, in any reasonable time. And so it's been moderated growth in CS in the core. Uh, so we have, you know, we have our target of growth there, which is, you know, to get to around 25. 
uh, FTEs. Um, and then we had targeted growth of CS plus X faculty. Uh, and this happened through the Bren Chairs uh, program where we hired six or seven faculty in a, in a very short period of time, actually senior faculty just post tenure that were all kind of CS and something else. Uh, and you know, these are people like Aaron Ames and Sunjo Chung and Lior Pactor and uh, so some very you know influential senior names now on campus that helps kind of make those bridges. And this this also served in the undergraduate part of supporting and providing a variety of new classes that are focused on impact outside of CS, but also on the faculty level of creating bridge bridges where you know people are in the CS and CMS curriculum and faculty meetings, but also you know, going and conveying and, you know, communicating with biology or astronomy or wherever their other half is uh, to help build those connections, both sort of educationally and research wise. Um, and so, so there was, that, there were those two focuses on faculty growth. There was uh, also the realization that we just will have to have teaching faculty. That's a, a small extent in CS to help uh, cover that. And so we pushed for the creation of the role of teaching faculty at Caltech. Uh, and Ravi finally, you know, was able to be successful in making that happen. And so now we have, uh, you know, official teaching faculty with, you know, teaching faculty hierarchy uh, within CMS. And I think we have nearly all of them on campus, but a couple other departments also have some teaching faculty. Um, so that gave us kind of the, the faculty level components. Um, and then we also started to create uh, the data science undergrad program with the idea of there's a lot of people doing CS specifically that what they really want is to use data in the service of something else. And so if we can make a data science program, that'll actually ease the load on CS a little bit because there will be this other avenue and data science faculty are, you know, many across the institute, whereas you know, there's a lot of people that would be happy to, you know, uh, advise somebody in data science that might not be feel as confident in advising them in kind of core CS areas. Uh, and so the data science thing was intellectually very motivated and appealing for students, but also served as an escape valve to, you know, have some students do that instead of CS and open up a new door to a new set of faculty that can support that program educationally. Um, and yeah, and so all those things were kind of on the educational front. Um, but then the other piece is you know, on the research front, supporting the intellectual connections that come out, mm -hmm. given that we have a small core in CS and, and there the approach was fundraising uh, and postdocs. So fundraising to provide seed funds so that these faculty could spend less time getting grants and more time focus, you know, on these collaborations. Uh, and then also on the postdoc side, you know, Jason Martin is an example that we talked about today, but, you know, postdocs often serve as really nice bridges between faculty. So, you know, they're, they're faculty, we treat them as faculty without the, uh, you know, requirements of teaching and administrative load. Uh, and so they have more time and they have that skill set. And so they, they often, you know, we, we have about 20 or 25 at a time in the department and, and they always bridge faculty and, you know, create connections and collaborations that weren't there before. They also take surfs and advise grad students and, you know, all these sorts of things, teach classes occasionally. So they are very good magnifiers of the, uh, uh, you know, faculty effort, faculty time uh, in terms of education and research both. Adam, last question for today, going back to in our first discussion, talking about the way Caltech really supports its junior faculty. And there's a there's an impetus to success, that it's really success for all involved. Contrasting that with your new office that you just got from your predecessor who did not get tenure, when it came time for your <laughs> tenure talk, what were your feelings and what did you want to emphasize in terms of making the case of the significance of your research? Yeah, so we don't really have tenure talk in CMS in the same way uh, that some places do. But, but at the same time, I did, you know, there's there's some sort of idea that you go out and you do a tenure tour uh, and you go give talks at a bunch of places where you're you know where you haven't seen people in a lot of little while so people are aware of your work. Um, I, you know I maybe naively but I think you know I was tenure was never a big stressor for me. I always had the feeling like you know I'm doing good work 
uh, Caltech, I think, can recognize it. And if they can't, I'll get a job at another place that will, and it'll be fine. Um, and so tenure was never a major stressor for me. Um, but I did, you know, go out and give my tenure tour. And, and, you know, for me, it was really fun to go out and talk about things rather than any sort of narrow per paper model. Talk about, you know, here was the vision. Here's how the theory and the practice intertwines. And, you know, we were able to, you know, get things deployed and look at where we are today. So it was, it was a, you know, my research had hit at the right times where, you know, at that point I could talk about both the mathematical algorithmic work and the deployment with HP and could point to really empirical results in industry. Uh, so it was, it was a very nice uh, time to be talking about the full, full life cycle of a research direction in the data center work. And I, I tended, you know, at that point, I didn't talk much about my economic work or the smart grid work uh, because those were a little bit more in their infancy than the data center work, which had really hit. Um, but I felt like that was, you know, enough to hang my head on. So I didn't need to worry too much. And, uh, and for me, it was a big question, you know, the, the biggest question around tenure was they, I had been asked to go up early and I was, you know, not sure whether that was really a good idea. Uh, and, you know, I did, I did go up early. Uh, and in retrospect, I wish I hadn't. <laughs> Why not? What's the, what's the, what's <laughs> the, the, uh, the moment of getting tenure became, you know, uh, uh, especially it was a time at Caltech where we had just gotten rid of the associate for most people. Yeah. So it was straight from assistant to full. And it meant that now all of a sudden I was asked to do all these tasks in my research <laughs> community that only full press professors are asked to do. And I was no longer eligible for any of these junior faculty awards or grants that, uh, you know, were easier to get. And so there was, you know, just this rude awakening of uh, extra duties and harder funding uh, overnight that I could have put off for a year or two. If I wanted. <laughs> That's great. It's a mirage of a full professorship that you see in exactly. retrospect. <laughs> Adam, that's great. Next time we'll pick up post-2012. We'll take the, the story okay. right up to the present.